and we will finish it next week. And then the week after that, we'll do the cleanup at the park. And then the week after that, we'll be. Are you dying? And then the week after that, will be the uh, the the party. Um, so we'll we'll figure out what what we're gonna do and that kind of stuff next week for the party. Um, I my the the pastor at the church that I used to go to um, before I moved down here. Um, he had his daughter who went on to Will of Fortune. And they told them, you know, you can cheer, whatever. Uh -huh. And so when it came, you know, when Pat walks around and asks the people yeah. about themselves at the uh -huh. beginning of the show, um, well, the daughter's sister came too, and she's kind of got one of those piercing voices. Uh -huh. And <laughs> she's <laughs> – Pat all says, you know, okay, so tell us about yourself. And she says something, and the sister – just screams as loud as she can. Oh, no. And Pat goes, somebody just get electrocuted in the audience? Or did, oh, boy. <laughs> or, is that, or is that a fan? <laughs> and she goes, that's my sister. And they aired it like that. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's oh, no. great. Anyways. Wow. Okay, so just a recap of what we've been looking at. Uh, Philippians was written by was, Paul. Was this recent that that happened? That or? was in 2008 or somewhere around there. So, so not really. Not really. Um, I might be able to find the video, though. Hey. <laughs> I should. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Philippians was written by Paul. He is in prison in Rome, um, and he's gone through a lot of suffering up to this point. Um, and the Philippians are also going through suffering. Uh, in chapter 2, we looked at watch out for others at the expense of yourself. That's kind of a, a big thing in Philippians, especially because now that we're in chapter 4, he's talking about the conflict between those two women. Okay, So let's remember that. Excuse me. Even if you obey God, you will have struggles. We see that with the Philippians and with Paul and throughout the whole book itself. So there's that. Um, we can either seek our own glory or God's, but not both. We saw that in chapter 3. And then anyone can fall away, even Paul. We saw that at the end of chapter 3 where he said, I, I, I hope to make it. Um, and then Paul did not take sides in the disagreement. We saw that. That's how we ended last week um, at the beginning of chapter 4. So before we go to the question, I will read the verses that we ended on last week. And that will hopefully jumpstart us into the conversation. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Judea and I urge Shantiki to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay. So, have you ever been in a church conflict and you don't have to share details? A yes or no is perfectly fine on that part. Um, and if so, what was the attitude of those involved? And if you want, I can start off. Everybody thought they were right. Everybody thought they were right. Okay. Did the did the issue get any resolution or no? Okay. Someone left mad. Okay. Um, has anybody ever experienced a church conflict that didn't end like that? <clears throat> I think we we all have – that's been the experience. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could describe not the event itself but how you felt in that situation, how would you describe it? Well, I was – I was kind of – I mean, I could view it from both sides, mm -hmm. and there was there was a power struggle there, and it was like no no leadership had really been established in this area, and so both of these people thought that you know they had all the say mm -hmm. and whatever, and so then the one just finally got mad. And Took his toys in that home. <laughs> took his toys. <laughs> um, and Literally. in your right, in your opinion, was one of the people right 
originally before everything went bad? Or do you think it was kind of something with no winners or no no right people? Um, uh, yeah, I, I do think there was a right side. Now, if you remember, we ended last um, last week with the simple observation that Paul didn't take sides in this disagreement between these two women, which is definitely something worth noting, um, because I like to take sides. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're wrong, and then this, these are all the reasons why you're wrong. And um, like like Paul said, I mean like like not Paul, you're not Paul. Like Chuck said with with that situation, and I, I think um, I think if you have ever been in church, you've been in a kind of conflict situation, you know, and. Um, it's just we as people are going to butt heads. It's going to happen. I mean, anytime you're part of a group or organization, that's going to happen. But um, I think the attitude is really what causes problems to be bigger. Does anybody have any idea as to why conflicts seem to escalate more severely in a church context than in a more... Club, you know, in, in clubs or in organiza other organizations that aren't uh, religious or um, or in, sometimes in family disagreements. Does anybody have any clues to why? And I don't, I don't have an answer. I'm asking for your what you guys think. Do you guys understand what I'm asking? Or yeah, okay. any ideas? Anybody? Something I've been struggling with trying to figure out. It seems like. Church conflicts kind of escalate faster, higher. You know what I mean? Kind of like, wow. Anyways, let's go ahead and go to um, go to the passage then. Um, first up is verses 4 through 5, which is immediately following where we left off last week. Um, oh, and just to let you know, Trent, uh, we have a, uh, a Facebook page for this group, and it is all the lessons that we do are recorded and put on there. So you're always you can always go back and listen to them. All right. Um, okay. So it says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Again, I will say, "Rejoice." Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Now, at first, it kind of seems like these verses are just kind of thrown in there willy nilly. But if you look at the context, first off, in the context of the book. Now, what I mean by that is, if you take these verses and remember the book that it was written in. You see that he's talking about rejoicing through suffering. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, when you're going through suffering, do you always remember to treat people nice and to just be gentle and patient with them? No, no. When you're going through a hard time, you bite their heads off. Uh -huh. So in the context of the book, he's talking about in the midst of your suffering. However, if you look at it in context of the verses around it, now what I mean by that is, um, you take take notice of the verses before and after it, it seems like he's actually talking about how to handle church conflicts. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, for those of you who have gone through church conflicts, how much different would it have ended if both parties were rejoicing the Lord and being gentle with one another? Just think. You don't have to answer. Just think about that. How much different that it could have gone? Because remember, we're not we're not doomed <laughs> to to leave the church angry if we have a disagreement <laughs> with someone. I mean, we can always work through problems and work through things. Um, and then also, uh, the word here in verse four it says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." Well, does that mean at all times or in every situation? And the answer is yes, <laughs> yes, at all times and in every situation. Uh, verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Uh, deal with things calmly to, 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 be, to, be gen, uh, to let your gentle spirit known, be known. Um, deal with things calmly. You know, don't, no, no yelling or you know, throwing stuff around. Don't punch the wall. <laughs> um, uh, with, good uh, with good results for everybody, not hastily or with anger. Sometimes when, when we're trying to resolve a conflict, we just try and nip it in the bud and just squash the rebellion quickly so we can be the victor. But let your gentle spirit be known. Um, 
without revenge, not not seeking, you know, just to make yourself happy, and w with patience. That's the idea of having a gentle spirit in the situation, as it applies to the situation. And then uh, the next thing I want to look at here is right at the end of the verse 5, if you notice, it has this little sentence. It seems like it's does not belong. The Lord is near. Now, what does that have to do with all these different things? <laughs> and one of the big things is that, um, and it's the second point here, the arguments, right, right here, the arguments are petty. You know, we think that our arguments really are carry a lot of weight and stuff, but the truth is that the majority of things that we really get carried away with and, and join fights in, they're, they're just petty things. You know, like, I wanted it this way, I wanted it this way. Well, does that really matter? No, not really. And the grand scheme of things, 50 years from now, is it really going to matter if you got your way? Well, no. See what I mean? But in our minds, this is something major. And, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, goodness. If you could only know the different dumb things that I have said. <laughs> oh, boy. So there, there's a few things that, that um, putting this, this simple sentence here, the Lord is near is saying. The first one, God sees how we act. So it's it's important to remember that God is near to us. Um, so with that being said, all the more encouragement to resolve things calmly and peacefully and quickly because the Lord is near to us. He's watching us. Uh, second up, with the one I already mentioned, our arguments really are petty in the grand scheme of things. So remember, you know, that the Lord is near. His, his coming is near. And, and in hindsight, when we, when we reach heaven... Are we really going to remember that one time? That, you see what I mean? Like it's just a petty thing to argue about. Um, the third thing is that prayers are heard. So when you are um, in conflict or in suffering, depending on whether you're talking about the book as a whole or this passage specifically, um, when you pray, the Lord is near to those to those prayers. You know, if, if you're having a conflict with someone and you pray, God, God will hear. So uh, the next thing, uh, God will help us resolve our conflicts. If you're Remember in the gospel, he even said this, where two or more of you are gathered in my name to, to carry out the discipline, I am there with you. So this is, it seems like an, a reminder saying, you know, the Lord is near to, to, to this church conflict. And as you seek um, to restore people, that God will be with, that God will be near with you. And the, and the last thing that he's, it seems to be saying, now I know you might say, how are you drawing out this much from that one little sentence? It's a very important little sentence. Um the last thing that I want to point is that we won't live forever. The Lord is near. In other words, your lives are just not that long. The, the Lord is near. You're, you're going to go to him pretty quickly. So do you really want to take this kind of trash with you? You know, if we could step into the future at, at our last few moments of life, I can almost guarantee you that none of us would look back and say, wow, I wish I would have won that argument. See, I mean, it's just not going to matter to us, you know. And with that being said, when you're in a church conflict or any kind of conflict, really for that matter, always ask yourself that. Is this something that on my deathbed I would be so concerned about? And if it's not, then leave it alone. Just drop it. I mean, so much could be could, could be fixed in our lives by just learning to drop things. Those of you who have ever been, ever been married know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Kind of a, a big sentence, so we're going to look at it little bit by little bit. First off, um, he's not saying that nobody will ever struggle with anxiety. And that was my biggest problem with this verse that I never understood. I thought he was saying you will either not feel anything and trust in God or you are not trusting in God and you will have doubts and anxiety. Well, as somebody who's had a lifetime of anxiety, I'm like, well, I don't like that, and it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. But if you actually look at what he's saying in, in the Greek and in the context here both, um, the word anxious actually means to be pulled apart. So now let's look at that, okay? Don't be pulled apart by things, but instead make your request be known to God. Well, that's a lot different. See, being pulled apart by something, that means it's – it's occupying all your time and energy. You're not fighting it at all. You're just sitting. In, have you ever met somebody who just kind of worries about something and they don't even try to like, you know, pray about it or anything? They just sit there and complain about it. They, they, you know what I mean? They just sit there and worry and worry and they work themselves up. And instead of taking it to God and instead of you know at least trying to combat the thoughts, they just kind of accept it as this is just the way I'm thinking about it. You know what I mean? That's what he's talking about. Don't be pulled apart by it. You know, fight it. And, and once again, next week we'll look at the different ways that Paul that Paul talks about in Philippians, um, 
to um, get over uh, 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 anxiety and, 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 and problems and stuff. So that, don't miss that. That's next week. I'll give you a list of the different things going through Philippians because we'll end up the, end off the book, and I want to give you that list. Um, but anyways, so uh, don't don't be pulled apart by it. Don't be. Here's the thing: you are going to have feelings. That's something that's going to happen, and there's nothing wrong with having feelings. You are going to struggle with things. Everybody's going to struggle with something differently. Some people are going to struggle with anxiety. Some people are going to struggle with depression. You know, whatever. Some people just struggle with different things, and when you are helping someone with their whatever they're going through, always remember that everybody has their own thing. And what I mean by that is don't look at it as you are better than them. Look at it as I have my own thing, they have their own thing. Just because they struggle in a different area than I struggle with doesn't mean that I don't have struggles. Remember that. Okay, so um, don't be anxious. For, don't, 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 don't focus on the anxiety. Don't, don't focus on, on the things that are, that are working you up. But in everything by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, uh, present your request. Make your make your request known to God. Uh, so you will feel anxiety, but don't be pulled apart. Rather, bring your request to God. So he's talking about two extremes, okay? Being pulled apart by your anxiety, or bringing your request to God. Have you ever brought a request to God while you're still anxious about it? Yeah. So how how do you bring your request to God? Well, that's the second part of the verse that he says there, um, in everything by prayer and supplication. Or uh, some, some translations say uh, prayer, prayer and petitions. Uh, it's basically the same idea. By asking and um, asking fervently, um, asking sincerely, repeatedly, um, begging. Um, these are all good synonyms that, that you could... What was he saying about what does it mean to pray and, and uh, make a petition? So, if God knows that we have the needs, why do we have to make the requests? Well, if you look at the context, we can deduce a few things. First off, it builds our faith. If you're struggling with something and you bring it to God, that that, that builds our faith because it teaches instead of sitting around, you know, worrying and being afraid and and, and going backwards, it, te it teaches us to just take it to God instead. So that builds up faith. Um, second off. Uh, it, it acknowledges our dependence on God. So when we pray to God, we're acknowledging, God, I can't do this. I need you to do this. You know what I mean? And then the third thing is it's an act of obedience because God himself told us to make our, to, to, to pray and ask. And Paul is here is writing, um, also teaching us to, and Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So God has told us through Jesus and through the other biblical writers and also through Paul. Um, so those are the main three. And then the, the third thing that is kind of in the middle of this very clustered verse is with thanksgiving that your request be made known to God. So, okay, what are we doing? We're making our request made known to God. How? Through prayer and supplication, but all the while with thankfulness. Okay? So, stay thankful in the midst of your request. Have you ever, have you ever prayed to God and kind of just focused on all the things that are upsetting you? You know what I mean? Just kind of focusing on all those things that are irritating you. Well, instead of that, focus on the things that God has done in the past that God is doing. See what I mean? With thanksgiving. God, you never do anything for me to do. Oh, you day over here. She's such a pain in the butt. Versus, God, you were there with us. You, you, Paul just said that they that they were that they were fellow workers with them. God, thank you for those years of ministry. Thank you for that success. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for all these different things. Thank you for the, for what you day and I did in the past. Help us to be reconciled. See, in being thankful, I have now been able to refocus my prayer and to help us resolve this conflict rather than saying that you would punish her and bring judgment. And See what I mean? It changes the whole prayer when you join it with thankfulness. The whole prayer. Um, okay. And it also changes our mindset too. By remembering that the Lord is near, that was in the verse before, uh, we won't be overburdened with our requests. Why? Because we will remember that the Lord is near. So any requests that we make, whatever it is, if we're in a, in a conflict with someone, remember that the Lord is near. It, it's no request is too big. If if we're going through times of suffering and you make a request, don't the Lord is near. See, it's a thing of it's a thing of hope. Um, 
and we will be able to shift through petty prayers from the more serious prayers as as we're as we're doing this as we're as we're remembering that the lord is near as we're as we're remembering things like that we're able to to kind of shift through our prayers as we present them to god and say you know i'm praying for this thing it's kind of a petty thing for me to ask god for maybe i should just let that go you know what i mean not that we would ever pray a petty prayer all of our prayers are always righteous and we always say the right thing and always ask for the right thing so that takes us to verse 7 uh, and uh, through 9. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, God's peace that doesn't make sense will meet us as we trust in God with thankfulness. You understand that? So we are, with thankfulness, presenting our, our, our request to God. And the result of that, presenting our request to God, is that God will give us peace that doesn't make sense. Peace that goes beyond the circumstance, beyond the situation. Peace is beyond our understanding. That's a promise from God. As we present these to God, God will, God will give us peace. Now, here's the thing. What we want is we want a McDonald's menu, right? We want instant gratification, God to instantly answer. But sometimes God doesn't answer for weeks, months. The, the key is that we, that we get in there and keep praying. And you keep praying until the job's done. And if that takes months, it takes months. You stay in there and pray. So, I mean that's that, that's the way to uh, to move forward in this thing. So here's the here's the progress uh, pool here. Let me pull up my highlighter here, uh, or laser pointer. We'll do laser pointer. We got thankfulness combined with prayer, which leads to God's peace, which guards our attitudes and our thoughts. If you look here in in the verse, and the peace of God, which surpasses all com comprehension, is something that, that doesn't make sense will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Now, why, why does it matter that it guards our hearts and our minds? Because it guards our attitudes, that's our heart. We won't be bitter, for instance. And our thoughts, we won't be sitting there thinking about how they wronged us. See? Peace attained in this way will literally change you. You will literally think differently. You will literally feel differently. It will literally change you. Um... Then verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and of anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So right here he's talking about thought control. And there's two kind of aspects to it. The first is a physical aspect. The second is a spiritual aspect. So what I mean by that is, okay, so if I'm thinking of things that are, um, things that are right, well, so God's law is right. Um, whatever is pure, um, you know, Jesus' life was pure. So that's more of a spiritual aspect. But also there's there's a physical aspect to this too. And that's when you're thinking, think about good things. Don't think about bad things. You know what I mean? Like if, if you're in a conflict with someone and you're thinking about all the times that they did you wrong, would you say that's a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Well, a bad thing, right. Yeah. But if instead you think about good things, things that are of good report, like maybe, um, I don't know, uh, Isaiah is in a college class and he gets a good grade, but that'd be a good thing because he's succeeding, and I, I want him to succeed, right? So I mean, think about things that are good rather than focusing your attention on all the bad things. Um, so, so thought control in ver verse eight, um, and especially is that. Uh, I'll go ahead and say that too. So there's, along with that physical and spiritual aspect, there's a kind of as it applies here. Two sides. T people typically talk about the devotional side. You know, think about uh, you know memorize scripture and stuff. That's thing about the good side. But there's also, like I'm saying, the conflict side of that. When you're in a conflict with someone, purposely redirecting your thoughts to things that aren't bad. So that takes us to verse nine. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So now we have a second um, way that God will give us peace. By living above reproach. God will be with us when we live our lives according to his standards. Now, once again, this is not about being perfect. We already looked at this a hundred times. Um, living above reproach just simply means um, trying to live God's ways. It's not about being perfect. You will not be perfect. Paul was not perfect either. Um, okay. So before I go to the next uh, next point here, does anybody have any questions or comments? Either or. No, 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 we're all good? Okay. So through lifestyle and prayers, God gives us peace. See, wh one thing that we try to do is we try to do one or the other. I'm going to live however I want, but then I'm going to have a five-minute prayer and it's going to fix everything. 
Or we go to the other extreme. We pray about it, but then we don't do anything about it. But if we combine praying about it and doing something about it, see what I mean? Then we're going to – like, let me give you an example. I have a Ouija board in my house, and I'm, you know, playing with it all the time. And then I'm having nightmares. So then I pray about my nightmares, and God gives me peace at the time, but he also expects me to get rid of the Ouija board too. Yeah. See what I mean? Like, but then I keep on to it, and I keep using it. So then I have more nightmares. You see what I mean? It's kind of like, well, watch what I'm doing, and then put that into practice in yourself. That's, that's what Paul is saying. So uh, the last section will end here. Just a few things. Verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. At first it sounds like he's kind of maybe reprimanding them, getting angry with them. But if you are familiar with um, ancient writing, it's just a type of writing. He's not he's not um, uh, guilt tripping them. Basically what he's saying is he hasn't heard from them in a while. But he knew they didn't stop caring. If you look at the end of verse 10. Indeed, uh, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Okay, then verse 11. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now, if you remember, one of the things that he talks about with the false teachers is that they oftentimes are just out after it for the money. So it sounds like Paul's saying, hey... Give me all your money, but if you keep reading, he makes it absolutely clear he wasn't after the money. It's not about the money itself. It's about what the what the money meant. It, it it meant that they were thinking of him. It was something that was that was that was good. They were using what they with the resources that they could to build towards uh, the kingdom and, and Paul's what Paul was working towards. So verse twelve through thirteen, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. Um. Oh, did I finish, not finish 11? Yeah, I did. I'll read 11 again. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and being hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, if you've ever been at like a gym, for instance, you know how many people misquote this verse as, you know, I can just power through things. But that's not what he's saying at all. In whatever circumstances he has learned how to be content with either having a lot or having a little, having um, having food or not having food, whatever the circumstance, he's learned how to be content. And his secret is this. God will strengthen him to face whatever God has called him to. Whatever God calls you to, and Paul to, whatever God calls you to, he will give you strength to go through it. As, as you're seeking him, he will give you strength for it. That's an encouraging thought. Now... I know that people think, you know, God won't give us more than we can handle. That's definitely not what he's saying. You know, I've already talked about that. Paul, I mean, Chuck also talk, talked about that. God will give us more than we can handle. But the good thing is, is he will also give us the strength to endure it. See what I mean? That's a good thing. That means I can't deal with this, God. Well, that's okay, because God can lead us through it. Well, those are two very different statements. So I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. And in any every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled with, uh, filled and going hungry. I'm, I'm okay. I, I'm going to be content in whatever situations come by. Having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. Whatever comes by, I can be content because God will strengthen me. That's that's an encouraging, an encouraging thing. And so we'll end on verse 14, the next verse. Now, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction, even though I'm content with whatever God call, whatever God brings me through, even though I, I'm not after the money, and even though you know, I would have been fine with whatever happened, regardless, it is good to have the companionship. It is good to have your support, and it is good to know that the money that you gave is going to go to a good purpose. And if you read through the rest of the verse, I mean, rest of the chapter, he talks about that. But we're going to stop there because, well, it's time. So were there any questions? No? Okay, we will finish this next week, and I will give you that list of uh, um, how to combat anxiety according to Philippians. So the riddle of the week, guys. Imagine you are in a dark room. How do you get out? Remember, don't answer until next week. Don't look up the answers. Don't ask anybody for help.
And if you guys forget it and you you know somehow lose the lose the picture or maybe you didn't take a picture, um, it will. I do do the recording is still going, so it will be on the end of the recording too. So you can always look it up on Facebook too.